where does Roe v. Wade, the, the killing of Roe v. Wade, uh, land on the trajectory or the timeline of what you see as being imminent violence in the United States between various factions? Well, I, I mean, I don't know specifically about the violence um, because, you know, it's a legal change rather than a rather than the buildup of like the far right militias and so on. But it is very much a premonition of civil war, because essentially what you have is you are establishing a double legal system in the country. Right. Like you like a, a woman in Missouri will have a different legal status than right. a woman in Illinois. And that ultimately is unsustainable on a number of fronts. Um, you know, ultimately, when you have that fracturing, uh, you that tends to lead to, um, you know, to to political breakdown, like legal breakdown tends to lead to political breakdown. But I think, you know, m more importantly, on the violence front, like what's happening in America is that the legal system is losing its sense of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. People no longer believe that it's fair. People no longer believe that it's a legitimate expression of popular will. And when you lose that, you've lost everything. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, it, this is one of the things that everyone takes for granted, equality under the law. But when you don't have that, you don't have much. Right. You don't have you don't have a lot that is worth preserving. Um, and so, um, you know, th and that that absolutely tends to lead to violence. So, you know, to me, this is just one step. And honestly, this is the beginning of a lot of steps like this, where the political legal institutions of the United States lose their legitimacy. And as they lose their legitimacy, violence tends to rise. In your amazing, uh, amazing book, uh, The Next Civil War Dispatches from the American Future, which I've been reading, and, and I have to say, as I read it, I have moments where I go, oh, fuck. Yeah, I know. You think, what do you think it was like writing it? Jesus Christ. Jesus, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, fuck. You know the yeah. thing that resonated with me, and I was, I was uh, you know, speaking to my girlfriend about talking to you and everything that's going on. I was like, the, the thing that popped out the most was that it always feels normal before. And yeah. we were sitting, uh, doing the most normal thing, you know, eating eating a, a karage with a Sapporo beer and a beautiful patio. And I was like, it can flip so quickly. And, Absolutely. And so your book to me, it, it, it was it, it, it was like kind of like a treatise on human nature. And the thing wow. I wanted to ask to you, ask you, was that because you talk about he, even in the American Civil War, there was that I think it was a general who said, "I will drink the blood of every soldier who dies," uh, yeah. as if to say that I'm not going to be drinking any blood. Right. What What well, do you think it is about us that we just don't know how to grasp this kind of stuff? And people must have looked at you and said, "This alarmist here." Oh, but yeah. really, I don't think so. I don't. No, think no. So. I mean, you know, I, I remember I've been like this was based out of a magazine article I wrote in 2018. Um, yeah. But I really could see this coming when I, I went down to cover the 2016 inauguration for the Walrus. And like you mm -hmm. could it, I mean, it had fall of Rome vibes, right? Like mm -hmm. it was like it was like an end of the empire kind of day. Like these lar these large groups of left and right, the police, you know, with cameras, the, the, the police in the middle of it, not having any idea what to do. Like, and mm -hmm. I mean, who can blame them? They just didn't know what to do. Um, yeah. Violence, uh, you know, overreaction, a, a guy standing up on stage and saying this American carnage. Um, you know, nobody ever wants <laughs> to see what's right in front of their face. Right. Like, like th th that's the hardest thing to do um, for when you're a journalist. Right. I think even, you know, it's funny because of COVID, I hadn't been to the States for like two years. Right. And I when I was showing this book to like friends of mine in the States, reporters, like people that I knew, you know, people who are on the ground, um, what they said to me was like, I think you're right. But I think you're I think I think you think it's happening too slowly. Like it's happening faster <laughs> than you think. Yeah. And I didn't want to believe them, but it's true. It's happening very, very, very rapidly. Um, and it's, it's unfold, like it's unspooling very much more quickly than I, you know, I really believe. No, I don't think anybody wants to see it coming. Um, you, and that was you, certainly true in the first civil war. Like, as you say, like, you know, no one, like literally they had to, the North had to send to Europe for weapons. They didn't have any rifles. 
right? right. Like they didn't, they weren't, they were totally unprepared for this eventuality um, because it's so horrible, you know? And I mean, one of the things when I was t- touring this book, I remember like I was on some far right show talking about this stuff. And one of the commentators said to me like, well, do you think a civil war is that bad? Like, do you think that it might clear the air? And I was like, well, you know, last time, like, 3% of your population died. Like, 30% of men in South Carolina died. Like, it's like a a civil war, wherever it happens, is the worst thing that can happen everywhere. Like, in in England in the 17th century, it was the worst thing that could have happened to England in the 17th century. In Beirut, in Lebanon, the worst thing that could have happened to that country. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's, Mm. it's, 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 it's worse than being occupied, right? Mm. So... When they're in a state where they don't even know that a civil war is a bad thing, you know, that, that there's there's not a lot of cause for optimism there. So where do you think the unspooling is coming from? Because another uh, interesting observation you make in the book that I think is so poignant is you say, look, you know, Trump is a symptom. He's not a disease. He is not the disease. Yeah. And, you know, he even said, and you mentioned in a news conference, he came up and said, he's like, look, when I got here, the country was already divided. Yeah. I didn't divide the country. And it got me thinking that even if Hillary Clinton was to win, we would have been dealing with Benghazi, emails. Same stuff. Same stuff. But this the speed, how rapid it is. I know Torque and I are probably going to say it's like it's social media. I mm. think social media is like gasoline. But what do you think is actually unspooling? It's quicker then you have to. Usually. I mean, I wanted. I wanted to do a whole chapter on social media in the book. I was fully prepared to write like an, an anti. So, like, the, here's how social media added. Turn to off it. your phone. Like, yeah, your- you know, like <laughs> that. That's the problem. Like, I was, yeah. I was there. But then, you know, real. You really like, pretty quickly realize that, like, you know, Germany has Facebook. Canada has Facebook. Like, everywhere in the world has Facebook, but we don't have the problems that America has. Like, not even close. Right. And there is a specific I mean, it is the 64 million dollar question. Like, what is the cause of this? The ultimate cause of this, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the book, because the stuff is so inflammatory, I wanted to stay right on the facts, like right on the models that I chose, yeah. why I chose them, what like what they show. And I didn't go into like deep philosophical questions about like the American experiment or something like that. Sure. I will, I, I will tell you, I mean, I have my own theories, but uh, I mean, the the real when you talk to the the scholars of extremism and like where all this stuff starts, I mean, the num- the date that I kept hearing over and over and over again was 2008. Right. And in Obama. 2000. Well, the housing, it's a, a number oh, of factors. economic. I mean, I think yeah. the, the housing crisis is the big one for sure. You have the end of the American dream in a certain mm-hmm. sense. You have the end of this idea that all every generation is going to do better than the generation before. You have uh, a, a, an economic system, a financial system that's, a re, that's revealed to be fundamentally fraudulent on a number of really core mm-hmm. levels. Um, I think also the election of Obama, for sure, with we have a multicultural iconography replacing a white national iconography mm-hmm. and all, all that goes with the, like all that goes with that. And then also, I think you have the surge in Iraq, which fails. <laughs> and you have the end of the idea of America as this, you know, colossus that brings goodness to the world. Right. In, in terms of foreign policy. So all those things tend to happen in 2008. Um you know, the big causes here, like if you're choosing, like, what are the big ones? Um, n- number one would be the decline of the institutions and the decline of the trust in institutions. Like mm-hmm. by 2040, 50 percent of Americans will control 85 percent of the Senate. Right. So you have this. It, well, you have this just in, in intense illegitimacy. Right. That's mm-hmm. becoming like the Supreme Court is just a, another bit of that. Right. Like it's another example of like, oh, well, you know, they're going to use this mechanism to support to do, you know, to do a a policy that's massively unpopular. That was even in in, in the dissent, even in uh, Kagan's dissent. She was like, this is not uh, out of legalese that we're here. We're here because three judges with three different opinions showed up. Right. Yeah. And uh, and then there's also the fact that by 2040, America will be a minority, a a majority minority country. Right. So Mm -hmm. everywhere in the world that that happens, like there's a fascinating study out of India where it charted uh, Hindu violence against Muslims. And like it's not when Hindus decline, it's when Muslims rise. 
right? Mm-hmm. So the Muslims are the out group in India. Mm-hmm. And when and they do it amazingly just through spending patterns. So like as Muslims have more spending power in relation to the dominant Hindu majority, that's where that literally the violence starts in those places at those times, right? Mm-hmm. And you can tr- you can find that everywhere. That's not a that's not a white American thing. You can see that in India, you can see it all over Africa, you can see it in Europe and Asia. Um when you have a dominant group losing its dominance, there is political violence. That is a that is something that you see e- everywhere in the world, and you know that's that's coming to America. Too. That's coming to America too. That would be the those would be the deeper reasons. But you know the the, the other question of like where does it all come from? I mean that's really like I I I I, I don't I don't know. That's the, stri- the honest it, truth. It, it like it's so me, st- it's so it deep in their history. St- it strikes me that. Um, you know, civil wars are culture wars, no? Like, if you think of the invasion of, of Ukraine, yeah, you could say that's about Russian destiny and him wanting to go back to czar, pre-czarist Russia and all that stuff. But, but really, it's about money. It's about territory. It's about oil lines. It's about, you know, wheat. It's about things that foreign wars are often fought over, right? Blood and treasure. This, this war is a culture war, and... The turning point of Roe v. Wade is a cultural moment rather than more than a more than a legal moment, because if you are, as you say, if you Mm -hmm. live in Illinois, you can go get an abortion. If you live in Missouri, you can't. But you could go to Illinois. I mean, it's not like this is going to be physically. We'll see. They're trying to they're already trying to ban the the traveling. Right. But -hmm. But do do you think like how does one and I'm I'm scared to know your answer to this because I think I know what it'll be. How does one prevent a culture war. How? What do you see, if any thing, hopeful about the notion that the the people of America might come to some agreement about some of these cultural differences that seem to be pulling them apart? Uh, is there any solution well, to that? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, for okay, like. A few, a few things. Like one thing that they don't, they, like what the, what civil wars are, are struggles over the meaning of a country. Uh huh. Right? Fundamentally, like they're about power and they're about in groups and they're about and they're about control of things and they're about and they're about control of institutions. But ultimately, they're like when you talk to people on the far right and you talk to people in Chicago and New York or something, they have fundamentally different conceptions of America. Right. And what America means and what freedom means. Right. And, you know, when you like the 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 far right people that I talk to have what I consider to be, frankly, a completely untenable definition of freedom. Right. Like they go and say they say things like we're all slaves. Everyone in this room is a slave. Why are we slaves? Well, like if you don't pay your property taxes, the government will come and take away your property. Right. So it's like, like you're well, just a renter, even though you're an owner. Right? Yeah. It's right. like, I mean, is the existence of property tax the same as enslavement? Like, I, I, I mean, to me, those are those things are not they're not they're not the same point at all. But to them, they really are. It's right? just saying and words so, to make them mean what you want them to mean rather than what they actually mean. Right. Well, it's oh, that. no, no, no. They believe it. They 100 yes. percent believe it, and they have a, a and they and they um, like they, they they their vision of freedom is something that has a very deep cultural heritage. Like it's not something that is that was born in 2008. I mean, it is something that is very deep in this settler society, right? And um, and, and so I even like in the book, you know. The kind of journalism I do is not attack journalism. I I want. I mean, I was thinking about it funnily today because I was like, I I would hope that all the Nazis feel I didn't misrepresent them, right? Like I didn't want it, right? Like I didn't. I, I genuinely feel that way. Like I want the Nazis to feel like I gave their perspective right. the correct, like the way they want it to be presented. I mean, yeah. I obviously disagree with it, but I but I I didn't lie. Right? Like I I didn't I didn't spin. I didn't like I I I, I wanted them to to show them what how they really are um you know as for hope i mean i think in america right now you know see one of the things is that these cultural questions really come into play these this toxic political culture things come in when policy goes out the window Mm -hmm. right like i mean that's one of the reasons why these things are not as severe in canada as they are elsewhere because like 
we do policies all the time. Like we passed $10 a day daycare in this country like six months ago. Like that's so inconceivable to anyone in the United States that the, all they can do, the only influence they can have is to call each other names. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and like they, and like radicalize they can't have, each other. You mentioned they radicalize you talk about each how other. they radicalize each other. Yeah. They, 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 it's called complementary radicalization. I mean, it's a completely, mm -hmm um established sociological pattern and like it is exactly what happens in places like chile when it before it spiraled out of control um like they the the, the far right and the far left get this uh, in this hate on and they build off each other's hatred because they're both equally impotent right they both both sides feel completely under siege and that they can't do anything like the frustration that people on the left are feeling today after roe v wade the right absolutely has the same have have moments like that. They absolutely have same sense of deep humiliation and that they've lost their country. Yeah, right? like when Biden when Biden won. Yes. I always said I go guys, you need to understand cuz a lot on the left were even upset that, you know, Biden got close to losing. Right. In the beginning, I, you know, and but I was like, listen, I don't think you understand that there is like half of this country that has just yes. seen the worst thing that has ever that, that's happened. ever they really feel like they've lost the country. Right. Yeah. And so to me, if you're looking for hope, genuinely, uh, the, the two hopes are some kind of secession, like some kind of right. separation yeah. or, you know, or genuinely a, a second a second republic. Like they need to like what, what is it like France is in its fifth republic. Right. America's Republic is an antiquity. Right. Like it was written. The, the Constitution, as it was written, was written 100 miles from Virgin Forest. Well, this is right? what like I, wanted written, to, I wanted your thoughts on this, because I'm glad you're saying yeah. this, because I was saying to Moya yesterday, my wife, it's really looking like the U.S. Constitution, which was praised for 200 years as the most sacred document anyone had ever come up with. And my God, is this thing ironclad? It's really looking pretty flimsy at this point. I mean, oh. uh, the, the whole idea of this Supreme Don't tell Court Tech where Cruz. there's Don't lifetime tell appointments Cruz. and <laughs> the notion of yeah. an executive that is so centrally controlled and so powerful and this Senate that seems completely inoperative. Is the reason Canada, is the reason we shouldn't be so scared in Canada because of the parliamentary system? Is that the crucial difference Absolutely. Here? Well, there's a bunch of them. I mean, for one thing, our constitution's written in plain English in 1982. That if you right. if we, you and I decided to read it right now, we could actually understand it, right. which is not true of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Constitution. Um, there's also the fact that white people in Canada come in two varieties, that like English uh -huh. and French, which makes nativism more or less of a difficult. joke here. I mean, right? Very, I mean, yeah, very difficult. Like you know, like that's the, the the primary hatred, ethnic hatred in this country was between white people, right? Like that's something that we we somehow have forgotten. Like it's not taught in schools or anything like that. But that was what defined this country's, uh, you know, ethnic politics for two hundred years at least, right? Uh, but I, I think you know the, the the amazing thing about the U.S. Constitution, the mo the most crazy thing about the whole book, is that. Everywhere I went, every single person I talked to worshipped the U.S. Constitution. I mean, you go and Regardless talk to... Regardless of political stripe. Like, you go and talk to a Texas separatist. This is a guy right. who's trying to break away from the United States. He... And I'll say, well, you know, it conflicts with the U.S. Constitution, which it does. <laughs> no way. He's got all <laughs> these arguments about how it's completely constitutional. And I'm like, look, I come from a country with an active separatist movement. The Quebec, the Quebec Party Québécois, they're not arguing that they're in the spirit of the BNA Act. Right. Like they don't care about they're not trying to argue the queen would want this for us. Right. Like they, like it, it, it's and, and, and then on the other hand, you have like the New York Times does a spread of the U.S. Constitution where they have like Talmudic commentary on the side like it's a sacred document. And, yeah. and you know, Jefferson, Jefferson was very clear. He said a constitution should only last 19 years. He said otherwise it's a contract with the dead. And that's just ah. what they got, right? That's just what they've got. They've got a contract with the dead. You know, these people, the, the geniuses who wrote the U.S. Constitution, and make no mistake, it is a work of great geniuses. This is 18th century, right? Like, they're not, they're not, they're, they had no, they would never, the whole point of what they were doing is to make practical pol politics serve living people. That's the whole idea. And they built it practically in, in that sense. And so now it's when it's taken on these religious tones, 
it, the, the contradiction is too much, right? Mm. Like, you, like the Second Amendment is a perfect example where it's like, if you read it correctly, you should be able to allow... A well-regulated to carried, militia. But, but also, you should be allowed to carry whatever gun you want, including nuclear weapons, right? Mm. Like, that's... Because those people could never have conceived of, mm -hmm. of anything remotely approaching the the weaponry that we're that we're capable of today. I mean, George Washington is not think, sitting there thinking, "Yeah, some eighteen year old should have machine guns that can kill hundreds of people." And set, like the, it's just an old document, right? It's yeah. not, it's nothing personal. It's just like it aged out, and they keep worshiping it, even though it has. You know, it has aged out, and of course, you know the, the one of the thing about the about the Roe v. Wade decision, the Dobbs decision, was that it was so sloppily written because I think even the justices have just like you can put whatever you want on the U.S. Constitution at this point. Like it doesn't really it, it, like it, it. It's you're trying to interpret. I mean, they're literally trying to interpret 17th century English legal documents on abortion, right? As some kind of like precedent up to the writing of the u.s constitution to get it i mean what could be more stupid right and and i think ordinary people completely understand that like only only people who are phds in law would care about these these random arguments about 17th century law around abortion so this is all just part of the breakdown of the legal system Right. Like and and, and it, the cultural the way that culture interacts with the legal system and the way that it interacts with the political system is like super complicated and I wouldn't pretend to know it. But I will say that when you have a political system that functions, one of the things that's really great about it is that it leaves things that are outside of politics. It leaves really the important things for stuff that's out of politics and nothing is out of politics in America right now. I mean, yeah. you go to a grocery store, you can buy LGBTQ positive cookies or you can go and buy homophobic chicken sandwiches, right? Like every, absolutely everything gets charged with this hyper-partisan meaning and it's mm. totally destructive to the fabric of just basic existence. It mm -hmm. really is. We have to do everything we can in this country to stop it from to avoid that. Us. It is so fucking yeah. striking now that, that what you just said, that there is not... There's not a cartoon that come, can come out. There's not a cookie that can be put. I mean, every single solitary signifier of who you are is connected to your political affiliations. And, and I have to believe on some level that that's working for somebody. That, that the reason that oh, that's yeah. happening yeah. is because it's managing to sell shit to people or it's managing to uh, create a demographic that then can be sold things. Uh, is yeah. that well they literally are riding the angry algorithm right, right. anger drives engagement <laughs> and they literally ride it right mm. and they uh, and like it, it's just it's just it, it's such a disservice to politics well you know ultimately the thing about american politics is that it's post policy right like i remember in 2015 i covered the canadian election here and then i went down for the guardian to see a trump rally and a sanders rally Right. They were within two days of each other in Iowa. So this was like a chance to go and see both of them and have a look at them. And so a Canadian election, as you guys know, is so boring that it's barely <laughs> possible to pay attention, even when you're paid to pay attention. Yeah. Mm. Right. Like it's like it, there's like I mean, literally, the debates are like, sir, we need to invest thirty eight million dollars in education. No, sir, we need to invest forty three million dollars in education. How can you be so stupid? And then they fight over numbers that you don't understand. Yeah. And and then you and then it's over when you go to a, a when, once you cross the border, numbers are gone. Nobody talks about numbers anymore because they talk about God. They talk about socialism. They talk about these incredibly ethereal concepts that uh -huh. have no practical applications in anybody's life. And that's because, you know, the idea that you're going to take Bernie Sanders in 2015 and get him to the presidency and then he's going to be able to enact some law like is ludicrous. Right. Like yeah. they, they all they all know that that's not on the cards. Right. right. Yeah. Like the like, amount it, of people, Stephen, I would be like Bernie supporters would be like, do you understand how a law is passed in America? You right. need two thirds of the Senate. You need a majority in that in the House. Obama had a super majority. And the best thing that he could get was Obamacare. And, and, and they just they just don't get it. They, they just don't get it. They can't get it. They because can't they, because it's too it's too bad. It, to it's actually. The, the, the ultimate. Well, I think they are getting it. And the response is despair. Now, see, right. the right got it long ago. The right, right got right, it in right, 2008, right. right? The right yeah. got the system is in breakdown. Get what you can, 
right? The, the left has, is only, I think, figuring this out now. And actually, the, they've wasted the past two years pretty drastically. With what, was with Obama what, delusional? Because, you know, you, you talk about his speech in 2004. You're like, it's yeah. amazing. But at the end of the day, what a waste. Well, I, I mean, I actually find that blaming politicians... Um, it's not him specifically. It, well, it's, no, it's, no, I no, think it's what not, you're it's talking not really about liberals. About, well, I don't even blame Trump. That, right? right? Like, I don't even right. blame Trump. Like, it's not... That's not the, the... The point is not that what one guy can do or not do or should have done or what 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 if the race had gone this way or one of the like it doesn't matter like right. when you have a system in breakdown it really doesn't matter what parts you put in and what they do it's I, like as we said at the beginning if hillary were president i still would have published this book right like this yeah. like th this book would nothing in this book would really have changed right it, like the the inequality numbers that are the highest numbers they've had since 1776 the environmental mm -hmm. degradation that's producing environmental refugees you're, you're going to have internal refugee movements in the united states i mean we don't know if there's going to be pregnancy refugees but probably i mean mm -hmm. like they are building they are building abortion centers on the oregon border on the california border on on the illinois border like you're going to cross over from missouri there's going to be a river and on the other side of the river there's going to be a bunch of abortion clinics mm. what happens when one of them gets fired on right mm. like which they will right mm. so like you, you know the, the, the you see when you, you see when you listen to steven or you read steven you're like oh fuck <laughs> right yeah well and i mean when you it's talk true, to these but guys you're right it's you're so right yeah. it's true it's inevitable it, it's not hard to see like yeah, you know, no, I mean, it, like, it, like if you, like, I, I think what I did really in this book is I just went to these places and asked them, "What are you doing?" And they mm -hmm. told me, and I put it down. Like it's not actually that. It, it's not. It's not like it's some feat of insight to get so this let me, stuff. Let, let me play devil's advocate though, because I know that I'm sure, sure you've heard this from people before, which is, look, the American people are too fucking lazy to go to war with each other. There is too much. There's too much stuff on the grocery shelves. There's too much Netflix to watch. They're, they're too fat. They're too uh, stupid. They're too uneducated. Whatever it is, they are too yeah. cowed by the capitalist dream to ever get to a point of desperation where they're willing to actually go at it street by street with each other. Why is that not so? Why do you feel that there is a point at which that won't, will no longer hold? Well, there definitely is some evidence that the richer a society, the much less likely civil war is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not like that's not a factor. Um, but you have to remember, like, what I'm when I talk about the next civil war, I'm not talking about like Texas invading California or something like that. Like what I'm talking about is the rise of political violence to such a point that you have a situation like you had in Iraq or you had in Syria where it essentially, you're, you're, you're struggling between order and chaos in this insurgent and counterinsurgency struggle. It doesn't struggle take everyone, where, right? It only takes a few guys. Oh, absolutely guns. not. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and civil wars are never fought by, they're always fought. I mean, it, Ukraine's a bit of an, well, Ukraine's not a civil war, it's an invasion. But, um, but like the, but yeah, the, so money does actually mollify quite a bit. But also, you know, times are not always high. Like, like we the trump years were quite wealthy um and we still had a lot of unrest like a lot of of political violence um we're in the middle of high inflation we're in the middle of we're due for a major recession right um it, when those things happen also you know like you, you have to understand how much fluid money is in the united states right now like they just keep pumping out money right mm -hmm. and when they when they have a crash it's unclear whether they're going to have any bullets in the gun to fire to stop a, a, a true bleeding recession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what does happen when the economy crashes, right? Because this is capitalism. It works on boom and bust. Like, it, it, you know, a crash is always coming. That's the right? cycle. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cycle. <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic cycle, right? And, and so, what, yeah, what happens when the money dries up? Very, very hard to know. But, you know, economic models are actually the weakest. 
Like, I put all the best models I could find in the book, the environmental models, political models, historical models, and so on. But economic models are not worth the paper they're written on. No one, no one knows what's going to happen with an economy. They just mm. don't. If they mm -hmm. did, they, you know, some people claim they do. Mostly they've just been lucky. Right. right. But uh, like there. So, I mean, I have the guy from the IMF in that book talking about what a crash would look like in the United States. But it's not the same as like the the, the decline of political legitimacy in the United States, which is just I mean, you, that any like that. There's only one way to read that information. So, um, yeah. The other thing is that what tends to matter in political violence is the history of political violence in a place. So places that have coups tend to have coups. Right. Um, which America has never had, so, which right. is why it's super unlikely that there will actually be a coup in the United States. Right. Um, but presidential assassination and right. civil conflict, very normal. Normal. Part, absolutely part of American history from its mm -hmm. beginning all the mm -hmm. way all the way through to the 60s, all the way through to now. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, the money does help, but it's probably only temporary. I mean, it, we know it is temporary. And... And it's also like that's the more relevant factor is like what what are the uses of things? Rich countries fall into civil war. I mean that's not that's not unprecedented. I mean you but kind I mean, of paint I take a, a picture. You paint a picture in your book about you know the uh, the bridge, and it was so funny as I was reading it, I was like, wait a second, this is a literary device, right? Like wait a second, this yeah, isn't actually because <laughs> it, it's well, so it's so real. But what's interesting about it is that you talk about incoherence, that there's so much inc that they're incoherent what people are angry about and we even see it like the amount of hypocrisy and even the culture wars on the left oh yeah what what will the civil war be about I, am i wrong to say that the, the the american civil war was was at least for the majority of people about slavery but yeah. this one what is it going to be about because everybody seems like they're in their own little micro civil war with each other i was reading today in, in, the, in new york uh, magazine about this high school that that put a list of like boys who were evil or rapists yeah. and and that caused the civil war inside this high school and if you think about it we're all having these like micro civil wars with each other i know and because we're all in our echo chambers and because we all don't share a story what is this war going to even be about or are we just like self-destructing that's what it's well i mean i think you know order versus chaos is the right. nature of this struggle right, right? right like and and the problem is that any attempt to impose order like the theory behind the surge in iraq was that if you gave if you clamped down on the violence firmly enough you would you would have the space for politics right and people could negotiate and people could come to agreements between different groups but the thing that they learned is that by imposing order you essentially create huge amounts more violence. You said like the, the resistance to that imposition of order is ferocious and, right. and creates its own backlash, which is why no one no one could ever really win uh, an insurgent conflict, right? Like you right. like because anytime you, anytime you like the Iraq like the the uh, Afghan war, they go in and they sometimes they have days where they kill a hundred insurgents, hundred hundred people doing terrorism. Six months later. There's 300 of them. A hundred right? like of their it, brothers it, it, are, are are on the front line saying, "I'm going to exactly. get revenge." It makes it makes it makes it makes absolutely no difference, right? And uh, it it just makes matters worse. So you know, I mean, I think one of the things is we have obviously now. I think it is much less in Canada, like in America, they are brutalized, and the institutions on the left in America are absolutely brutalized. Like you know, the the feminist organizations who are going to have to deal with Roe v. Wade have all been mm. through identity politics struggles that is going to hamper their ability to function to to meet this moment. Like they they are they're we're in a we're in a state where America is just we're just punishing each other. We're like that's the only way we seem to be able to communicate is by punishing each other. And of course, you know, nobody grows through punishment. Like no. nothing, no, nothing. Like nobody learns anything through punishment. Like, it, mm -hmm. like there, there's just this constant need or it, to humiliate and exclude. I mean, you know, let's not do what aboutism here. Like when we're talking about the right, we're talking about violent factions who commit political murder, and the left is not. The very negligible groups on the left are doing that. But you know, I think this instinct to punish, which shreds left wing institutions. Um, mm -hmm. And leaves them essentially very vulnerable. Um, has has definitely partly led to this. I mean, yeah, the, the quest for purity has the really quest for purity. Us. I mean, the, the current brand of uh, 
you know, progressive politicians need to look at Dobbs as the ultimate failure. Mm-hmm. Like that is the like that is the ultimate failure. Right. You had you had the support of seventy percent of the population, whether they were left wing or not. You had uh, entrenched law. You had things that had been in place for fifty years. How the hell could they have lost this? Right. A right, I mean, it's, a right was taken away. Yeah. I mean that's. That's because incredible. Because but her emails. Unbelievable. But yeah, her emails. Like, like that quest they, for purity. Yeah, and the quest the, for and, purity. And not and the, and just sucking it up and yeah. getting a Democrat I mean, into the if, presidency. If we don't have solidarity, like, it's yeah. just going to be one of these things after another. Mm-hmm. And, like, beating the shit out of white feminists for fun, like, I, I'm sure it feels good at the time. And maybe it's pr- probably you're right. Right. I mean, probably they are annoying, but like the time has come to, to recognize that that's not the way you build coalitions. It's not the way you build action. It's not the way you win anything at all. It's not how you maintain a family. It's not how you yeah, maintain your own exactly. personal relationships or an organization. And for yeah. some reason, I want to talk quickly about Canada because you actually yeah. do mention in your book. I do believe that things trickle up. I oh, do yeah. believe We're, that that, you know, the Freedom Convoy is very much a product of January 6th. I do believe that we are probably in like the Tea Party era of Canadian politics, you know, the, the 2008, 2009, maybe a little. We're maybe in 2012. But I think, you know, I, I see the same kind of game plan, this talk about freedom, this culture kind of war happening. Oh, in Canada. I hate it. I hate it. Like, and, you know, I want to get your thoughts on on, 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 on the Conservative Party. Um, well, you know, James issues. Moore had a really interesting tweet today because, like, you know, just so you know, like, abortion is not on the table in this country. Like, no, not, not even not even remotely. No conservatives ever going to get close to it. Right. And I don't think they want to, frankly. Like, I don't think I don't think they're that insane. Right. I think they're actually more reasonable people. And we're still in a place all my family is in Alberta. They're all conservatives. I sure as hell don't think they're less Canadian because they're conservatives, right? Or that I love them any less because they're conservatives. Like my father was a conservative, right? I, like that's not possible in America anymore, right? Like that kind of. So, I mean, I think. But you're a shrinking really... population, Stephen. You're a shrinking population because <laughs> I, I hear it. I hear it often that anybody who voted for Doug Ford, for instance, is a despicable, evil human being. I know and that it, like, kind of talk. And, and what happens is that gets a hundred retweets. Exactly. But you saying my father is a conservative and I love him regardless. Have fun. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> well, like, but, you know, the thing is, I think one of the things about Canada is that we're much better educated than in the United States. And we yeah. don't like much better educated. And the other thing is we're much we're much more homogenous. I mean, the United States is 59 percent white. Canada is 78 percent white. Right. Like and then the, the other thing is, like, we're, we don't have an army of the dispossessed. Like in, in the United States, there is an army of people with nothing, with absolutely nothing. And they don't have health care and they don't and their children don't get educated. And they are human dust blown along those great plains. We don't really have that same level of things. Now, I absolutely agree. Like, for one thing, we need to stop the the far right stuff from leaking in obviously that was what the freedom convoy was and obviously the response was nowhere near harsh enough like they should have done what the french did immediately tear gas them like like there, there there was definitely a failure on that on that part and and also the conservatives i mean the conservatives have flirted with some of this identity politics stuff before and they just had their asses handed to them every time mm-hmm. they played that card we got to but you know from the left like i find it infuriating when when Trudeau imposes gun laws after there's a shooting in mm-hmm. in Texas, because we got our own problems. Like God knows, we got our own problems. We got we have we have the truth and if you want to deal with our own problems. Like let's start with truth and reconciliation. Like that's a lot to be going on with, right? Yeah. We've got we we've got you know low productivity numbers. We've got all kinds of economic stuff. Like we, we when the left seizes on these American identity politics issues and tries to insert them into the Canadian political sphere, I don't think they realize that what they're doing is totally toxic. Like, I, I genuinely don't think You really don't, don't think, think they... they realize that? I, I feel like, you know, part of yeah, the convoy, maybe. the trucker convoy thing was that made me so angry was watching Justin Trudeau, who I think knew perfectly well that he had an opportunity to to play wedge politics and took it in the most kind of cynical, 
yeah. um, uh, 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 lazy way. There was no need for the Emergency Measures Act. As you say, they could have towed those trucks and thrown some tear gas at them. It would have been over in 12, 12 hours. It almost felt well, like Justin Trudeau uh, saw an opportunity to cast himself in the role, which he loves to do because he's an actor, of kind of defender of liberal <laughs> values and defender drama of teacher. civilization <laughs> against these, you know, these these dogans. I, I, I don't I'm not so sure that we're mm. not seeing more and more of that kind of politics being played here. No, I mean, isn't yeah, Pierre Poilievre jumping on that thing. bandwagon? Absolutely. And I mean, we got to make sure these guys fail. Yeah. Like we need to make sure that they absolutely drastically fail because God knows there's a conservative movement in this country that's real and that's coming mm -hmm. to power again. And which, mm -hmm. frankly, they're not my politics. I don't like their politics, but they're not insane. Right. right. Like they're not like like they're they're not they're not even remotely close to what I see in the United States. Right. They're not the same yeah. ballpark. They're not the same game. Yeah. They, they, they're, they're not they're not they're not lunatics at all. Right? Well, and it's political and so, suicide to say you want abortion outlawed in Canada. It's just not going to oh, get yeah. you elected anywhere in this country, right? But like, also, nowhere. they don't want it. They don't. They like, don't they're they're right. not. They're not the. They're not that kind of. They, 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 those kind of wed, what they really want is like to hurt the to slow down the bureaucracy a bit, right? Like, right. like they're, they're they're not they're not the same thing even remotely. But you know, I mean, I think your point with Trudeau is like I think it's a little from column A and a little from column B. Like I think. I don't like to second guess the trucker convoy actions. I mean, I actually think the emergency, the, by the time they did that, it was kind of the only option because yeah. you couldn't tear gas them anymore. Right. But, but the, but, um, but you're definitely right. I mean, there's definitely this grandstanding on these liberal issues that are not our issues that are not our problem. And, and, and using them as a wedge. And I think that's just, that's not like, let us, at this point in our history, we have to be like, okay, larger things are at stake than than whether it's Doug Ford in 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 power at Queens mm. Park. Like, we need to prevent uh, this neo fascism and this. Well, this this just this post policy way of politics, mm -hmm. right? Where it's right. totally divorced from any actions. Right. Like it's totally divorced from what the government is going to do or how they're going to govern. It's just all this emotional nonsense. Like if Canada has something going for it, it's that we're too practical. We should. I mean, I would hope that we can keep that kind of like practicality around politics that I think has been pretty served us pretty damn well. I, I really hope so, too, Stephen. But, you know. I, I want to kind of push back on, on on some things. I think the reason why they go there when let's uh, you know when uh, the Dobbs decision came down, and Trudeau you know really went out and 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 did what he did, because a lot of people were like, oh yeah, well why don't you legislate it? And the truth is, the majority of people don't know that it actually is in the Canada Health Act. It yeah. is legislated. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what's going on is that I I wish you know Tork and I always call for we need another age of reason. We need another age of enlightenment. Oh, you know, the, the printing press happened. We need a return to and humanism. We need a yeah, humanism. We, sure we, we, need, we need a rally for sanity, a rally for nuance. And it really feels yeah. like we have two extremes. Like, I think there I are mean, seven you have these guys of us on the left. that are normal. And, and so yeah. how, do we, how do we energize the normal? Like, I think we all have different political. We're like, you know, left of center, center, yes. torque, 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 chilling in the left over there. But yeah. I think we would all sit down come in a room and compromise and well, find I think, something first of all we are now. relatively we we have retained our sanity right Be, in so far as we believe that government is involved in the business of governing and yes. that that is what it does and like it makes policies sometimes those policies work sometimes they don't you get you get the one you keep the ones that work and you throw out the ones that don't or you try right mm -hmm. but I, I like so i think we we have retained that i mean i find it incredible when you have people on the left say things like well, why don't you legislate it? And it's like, look, Wake you're up. not in America. You don't yeah. live in New York. You might want to, yeah. but actually you live in Ontario. <laughs> there's uh, there's already all the, and the same thing with Tamara yeah. Lynch's husband, where she, where he was like, well, I thought I, I thought I had first amendment protections. Right. You've been out here waving the Canadian flag yeah. for six weeks and blaring your horn. And you think you have first amendment protections. This, okay. this is what the toxic spillover really looks like. Well, it, Stephen, like this, you never you never went to WhatsApp University. 
<laughs> well, I mean, you know, like I certainly uh, th there's this there's this um, I, you know, I felt it even in I remember at the um, at the Wall Street uh, Occupy Bay Street. I remember going through Occupy Bay Street when I was a kid and thinking like you got you guys you realize that you're protesting for Canadian banks to be regulated exactly the way they are currently regulated. Like, yeah. exactly, like, like, like we survived that because our banks were regulated correctly. So now you're out here pro like, I know America is exciting. Like, I, I get it. Right. Like, I get that. I get that. It's much more fun. And like, like the drama is so much higher and the stakes are <laughs> yeah. so much higher and so yeah, on. Like, yeah, yeah. I get it. But like, there's, there's lots here too. You know what I mean? There's like lots to be, there's lots to be going on within our own politics. that needs a lot of fixing. Right. I mean, we're bringing in. 400,000 immigrants next year. They are PhDs. They are the most elite immigrants in the world and they're all going to be driving cabs. This is a yeah. problem. This mm -hmm. is a real problem. Like mm. my plumber and they can't has afford a to live anywhere, you know? They can't afford yeah. to live everywhere. My plumber has a PhD in rocket science. That's literally true. Jesus the guy who comes Christ. in fix my toilet, right? This is not functional. Like, this is not acceptable. Mm. Right. But there's lots of things like that. We don't have to borrow the abortion debate to have our own yes. policy debate. Yes. You, you know That's what I the mean? debate we should be talking about. We should be talking about your plumber. Exactly. What is this guy doing doing freelance plumbing work for me when he mm. knows about friction ratios and mm. uh, you know non gravity situations? It's ridiculous. Why don't we have but, why do we have a shortage of healthcare workers when we have thousands of doctors and nurses who are fully qualified? Yeah, but, but that's just and, I mean, and, and, you know. and we have people who are doing their residency who are going to become clinicians who are thinking to themselves, I can't even afford to live in Toronto. So I, where am I, I think I gonna honestly go? like, this this American thing, it's an alibi for us. It's ah. like we don't have to face our own ah. demons. You know what I mean? Like, we don't have to face our own. Like, we got plenty of problems. Plenty. You know, mm. but as long as, the, as long as the news that we listen to is like, you know, the rioting and the uh, and these terrible laws, which are all and they're all going to affect us. Um, we don't have to pay attention to them. You know, we don't have like we can we can we can ignore our own. Like, a, it's sort of like when you have a neighbor who's a meth addict and you're like, well, I'm anti drug. I'm not a meth addict. Hooray for me. Like, it's not, I, like, I, I don't really think of that as an achievement. Stephen, what's your take on where this goes next? There was talk, Clarence Thomas already started talking about other uh, laws that might be affected by this regarding rights to privacy. In other words, gay marriage, um, sex before marriage, really, right. really heavy duty shit. Do you think not interracial Supreme... marriage though? For do, him, do, you know. yeah, well, yeah. Do you think <laughs> if the Clarence Supreme Thomas Court... reverses loving, that would be the ultimate. That would be really <laughs> something. Do you think yeah. they're? Did you think that's realistic? Are they really going? No. Are they that radical? Is this court that radical, or are they going to back off now because of the sense they get? I mean, I have to believe that Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Comey Barrett and these people are not entirely unafraid at this point oh, for their own physical in, safety you know like they're literally in hiding i mean this is part of the problem too right like when you're just judges can't you know are worried about their physical security like the basic right. per, the physical security of their children that's a broken system so do right? you think like, this ends here or do you think this court is a radical court and will keep pushing out at the edges of what they consider to be oh their it's a radical court it's a radical court and they're going to like next week they're going to essentially end the uh environmental protection act right like that's that's coming next week right like but it, it won't be it won't be um people won't care about it, it won't that be because it's not a cultural issue right exactly. it's, it's it, won't be, it won't be it won't be contraception <laughs> and it won't be and it, i i seriously doubt it'll be gay marriage i mean that would be so catastrophic for the conservative movement at this point like that, it, that it would. I, I actually don't think they even want it. I, I mean, it's it's one of those things. Like, I'm not even really convinced they wanted to end abortion. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like I think I, mm -hmm. I I I think genuinely this like they take up these these pol because they don't have it. You know, like you have no idea how poorly placed they are to enact the policies that they've just implemented. Like they don't, it, it's like that thing with the civil war where they, they got to the civil war and they realized, Hey, we don't have any guns. Like in the first civil war, like we need to go to Europe to get rifles. Like they've outlawed abortion in all these trigger States, but they have no, they have no legislation on DNCs. They have no legislation on, they have no idea are, are police supposed to be at OBGYNs? What, what is the policy around miscarriages? Right. What is the policy around? They, 
and, and you know, before in the sixties, no woman was ever punished for this, right? Like because women were too soft. Uh-huh. Like it was the doctors who were blamed. Like no woman who got an abortion was ever. So now th- they're in a legal situation that they literally have never faced, and they. Right. I don't think they ever thought they would get there. Like it is a it is a right. sort of dog catches the car that it was chasing. Them. <laughs> right, right. Like they don't like <laughs> right. they, they don't know what. Um, they're what's so the, what's unper- the PR fallout of prosecuting an 18 year old Hispanic woman for getting an abortion at six months because she was going to die of ectopic pre- pregnancy? Right. Like, but also, how do you, what's how the, do you go what's the legal that? mechanism? What's the legal? Mm-hmm. Me- how are you going to enforce this? I mean, right. You know, they, they've just spent billions and billions of dollars on a drug war that they lost. I mean, you can go and buy heroin for ten dollars a hit on the streets of Philadelphia mm-hmm. today. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you can't control the flow of drugs into your, how how are you going to uh, you know among very vulnerable populations, mm. when middle class people want to get access to a pill in the United States, they're going to do it, and like the idea that you can control that is ludicrous. Like it, it, I mean, they haven't put five minutes of. Do you know the reason? That, like. The most amazing thing about the whole abortion story in the United States is this. Between 2010 and 2018, abortion numbers in the United States declined by 13%. Do you want to know why? Because there were more Planned Parenthood clinics and they and they preached education and contraception. Duh. If you actually want to lower (laughs) abortion rates, you educate girls and women. Right. And that's I mean, the law will make nowhere remotely that difference. But see, because they don't think in terms of policy, right? Like, if you want a policy to to, to actually really, lessen abortion, to actually to really abortion. diminish abortion, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. entirely possible to do. The way to do that is through education. But they just they don't want they don't actually want that. What they want to do is scream at each other. One side mm-hmm. screaming life. And the other side screaming choice. And it's like, you know, there, if you actually want to solve this problem, there are ways to do it. But, you know, they, 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 that's totally beyond their capacities at this moment. Like they can't, been, they can't think through policy. You've been very generous and we won't keep you longer. But I do want to mm-hmm. s- ask one more question, which is, so if this isn't the straw that breaks the camel's back or that ignites the fire, what, what? What do you see coming that really worries you? What is the moment where you might, where we might begin to see uh, reports that in Texas, a group of protesters who were armed met another group of protesters who were armed and 30 people died? What's, what does that moment look like, do you think? That's nothing, man. 30 people dying in But that's protest. the beginning, that- right? Is that when, when you start to see armed well, conflict between non-governmental groups... Well, that's already happening. That was Kyle Rittenhouse. I mean, that's like right. that, that's that's def, that's definitely. I mean, that, like people describe that in the, all these legal terms. That's an insurgent. I mean, what do you think an insurgent looks like in South Africa? It's a young right. man with a gun defending community property. Like that's yeah. what that's what that's what an insurgent is everywhere in the world. It's no different in the United States. But right. like the uh, the the thing that worries me, like if you were talking about an actual conflagration point, I mean, when they find Nazis and accelerationists. Um, accelerationists are people who just want the end of the United States any way it can happen. Um, they found several of them with low-grade nuclear material. And um, I think, you know, the United States is incredibly vulnerable to spectacle and to spectacular acts of violence like 9-11. And, um, like, to me, January 6th was like the 1993 World Trade Center problem, right? Mm-hmm. In the sense that it was like, poorly organized didn't quite come off it was it didn't quite come off and it was also not it wasn't really done by the serious people right it was done by a kind of loner on the outside who was sort of peripheral to these movements but uh was not really central to the terrorist network and when you ask me like what what really worries me it's like the the much larger more effective better planned better armed better politically organized um, January 6th that could, where they were like low grade nuclear materials are used. And well, can America uh, survive another situation in which Trump becomes the nominee? Trump yes, loses an election. They could survive it again. 
a situation in which he loses and he claims it illegitimate. But this time he has an army of people. Um, in, I mean, in, you know, America, in, in America had process. a America in 1828. Andrew Jackson won the popular vote and he won the most electoral votes. And he was not named president because of a process called contingent election. Right. But he like, accepted I, the loss, correct? He accepted the loss. It's true. Um, so can America go through this again with Trump? <sighs> Man. That's that that for me is like the point where I go. I don't know if they can do that without some. You know what? I don't know if they can either. I really don't. Because that's where I we're mean, headed. So so that's yeah. why in a weird way I'm like, just let DeSantis win. But <laughs> oh, also yeah, reading but your book, I go to myself. At the end of the day, am I just delaying the inevitable? They, I mean, they've already named like 30 <laughs> solicitors general across exactly. the United States who deny the election of 2020 yeah. was real. So. You're already in a state where you know the only a minor, uh, only a slight majority of the country believes the last election was fair. Now, when the Democrats lose again and they lose by many, like you know, it's quite possible that in 2024 or 2028, a Democrat could win the popular vote by five, six million votes and still lose the electoral college, right? And would Democrats then feel that they're living in a legitimate democracy? I mean, I wouldn't. No. You know. No. And so, what 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 happens to them? Like, what do what what do they do? And like, you know, we're all familiar with right wing rage, but I'll tell you, like, the left wing rage is real too. You know, like the left wing rage is mm -hmm. is very very substantial, and it is going to find an expression. You know, and I don't think that expression is going to be entirely through democratic means. Like, I'm sure it won't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the political system is failing them. Like, how can you go after Roe v. Wade and say, well, vote them out? Like, you're already, we already did. Yeah. We voted for, we, we want, we've, That's you know, right. the other party hasn't won a popular vote in 30 years, right? Like, wh how much are we supposed to win before, for us to have our politics achieved? And I mean, one one real possibility is just radical defederalization. I mean, that's kind of underway already, where things will be right. decided by states. Right. Like the important right. things, important. And you essentially I mean, got about 35 different countries within the country of exactly. the United States. With a big military on top. The states are no longer united. They're not united anymore. They're yes. just states. That is not the worst case scenario. Yeah. Like, like I, I, I think a right. lot of people could live with that, you know. Right. That's actually right. the dream. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, you know, the justice. That's the best case scenario. Like, That's well, probably the, the best case scenario. This is a yeah. federalist dream. This is what it's yeah. all about. This is America. But Steven, it it's way. sobering shit, but you are brilliant at expressing <laughs> it. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and for coming back on the show, because I think it's important to take it out of the context of social media hype and people's extreme language and realize just how big a thing this is that we're looking at and how serious it is. And if we don't face it, it's inevitable. And maybe yeah. if we face it, there's some way of mol mollifying it to some degree. And, and well, that's we'll be prepared. Is. I mean, that's what I hope. Prepared. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like what I really hope is like senior people in Canadian government and business and like are reading this and being like, OK, I got to I got to prepare. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, like we were prepared for 2008 because they knew right. it was coming. They were smart mm. enough to know mm. this mm. is coming. That's a great, great, right. great analogy. Right. Yeah. You know, like they like and, and, and that, that like we're a small country. We're not like America. We can't make a lot of mistakes. Like yeah. our, our right. leadership, right. like we like if one bank fails in this country, we're all fucked forever mm -hmm. right like we need we need to be smart and un, and totally unsentimental and to and understand exactly where we are and prepare but you know like i i mean i actually i think on the other hand how much can you prepare for catastrophic failure of the united <laughs> states if you're in canada but you know i think i i, I think people are becoming aware of it for sure of just how much yeah. danger is out there well, thank you so much, man, for yeah. letting us know about it. Really appreciate it. And uh, always I a hope pleasure, we, guys. I love to love to talk to you, and hopefully, we'll have yeah. you on to talk about how none of it happened. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. I would love that. I hope this book becomes one of those like things you see in remainder book piles, and you're like, "Oh, remember when we all remember thought that? Yeah. America was going to end? That? that guy was so crazy." I, I would fear love that. not. I fear not. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. man. Really